Hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry in advance if I go over five minutes. <laughs> um, so thank you all for being here tonight. The summer of 2004, my mother says to me, we're going on a vacation to Mexico. I was 10 years old and remember being pretty excited. I even asked my mom which one of my toys I could bring with me. To which she responded, we couldn't bring too much, just the necessities. So we landed in Mexico after a seven hour flight and checked into a worn down motel room where we stayed for a couple weeks. Then one night my mom says to me, we're actually gonna go to the US to see grandma and your aunt. And that the trip would be a little harder than our trip, our flight to Mexico, um, and that we would be doing some illegal things. The trip to the US started by traveling closer to the US and Mexican border with four other Chinese immigrants who we had met along the way. On the night before, we were about to check out of our hotel room and start off closer to the border. My mom says, okay, we have to throw out a couple of, of our things just so that we were carrying less. Um, so we got, a, got rid of our bunch of our clothes. Um, she even ended up mailing some of our legal documents to New York just in case we were captured on our way here, which by the way, being, uh, ended up being lost in the mail. <laughs> um, next part's a little hazy, but one night, all of us set off for the border and had to trek through some type of forest in order to get closer um, to the border. It was pitch black, slightly raining, there were trees all around, and at one point we were walking single file on the side of a hill. My mother behind me and the man who would lead us to the US, our coyote, in front of me. I took a wrong step and slipped on some wet leaves and as I was about to slide down the hill, the coyote uh, somehow saw and grabbed me. He threw me on, on his back and carried me the rest of the way. The hike was a couple of hours long and went into sunrise, at which point we had to hide inside a big bush by the side of a river for about 12 hours until the sun set again before continuing our trek. We made it to our next hotel, and the next part of the trip is the hardest and the scariest. My mom, me, and one of our fellow companions who were traveling together would be the first to cross the border. We were led to a red convertible parked outside of our hotel and were packed into the trunk of it. I went in first, followed by my mom, and then followed by the other man whose name I, I, I didn't even know. Our drivers were two very nice women who during the drive, had the top rolled down, thankfully it was a convertible, um, and one of the back seats down in order to let me breathe. So I was the first one in the trunk and um, it gave me the chance of having a little more ease of breathing. After a couple of hours of driving, one of them leaned back and whispered, we're getting closer to the border, um, so I'm gonna have to put the seat back up. I said, okay. I remember the next moments very clearly. Um, my mom was holding me, I could feel her breath on the back of my neck. Uh, the car came to a stop, and I could hear the patrol, um, the border patrol agent and the driver chatting in a language that I didn't understand at the time, English. It was then that I thought about how much it would suck um, if they checked the trunk. Uh, they didn't, thankfully. Um, our car continued through, and we were in America. It was great. Um, my name's Antonio Suliu, as you heard, I'm 24 years old. I graduated with a degree in engineering from Stony Brook University. And tonight I'm here to share with you all that I'm a dreamer and a DACA recipient. While I was in grade school, the idea of college and adulthood seemed a great distance away. And so being an undocumented alien, as one front desk assistant once accidentally called, read out loud for my record um, in college, the world has always had a way of reminding me of it. Don't argue with anyone on the street. We see police walk the other way. If someone picks on you, just look down and leave. These were common phrases my mom said to me at the age of 10, as I left for elementary school every day. And still common phrases she says to me now, at the age of 24, every day as I leave for work. I understood the inherent and very real fear behind my mom's repetitive, repetitive warnings more and more as I continued through high school. But those years never reached their peak. Um, that fear never reached their peak. Largely because as I graduated high school, as my adulthood was kind of about to begin, and 
June of 2012, uh, President Barack Obama introduced a policy that would become DACA. I'm one of 800,000 DACA recipients who has the great privilege of being legally able to drive to my local target <laughs> with a smaller percentage of fear of getting pulled over. Um, I'm one of 800,000 DACA recipients who has the legal authorizations to use my knowledge, my degree, um, to make the city that I live in better, also known as working. <laughs> as I continued into adulthood and through college, my growing up continued too. There were some negative experiences. I flunked some classes. Physics was really tough. Um, I went through a couple of bad breakups um, and even got into my first fender bender. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> However, there were some really positive experiences too. I finished school and received a bachelor's degree. The first one, my immediate family, before my mom got married. I met my boyfriend of now four and a half years, Keegan, who's in the audience today. Um, and I even got a full-time job after graduation. But one experience that's had a large impact on me happened more recently. This past October, my parents and I are semi-debating over dinner about whether I should or should not attend the DACA rally and for the first time, like tonight, share my story in front of a couple hundred people. Their argument ultimately teetered on one point. What if people find out? Of course, what if the authorities find out? Of course, they already knew I was here. Um, but also, what if our relatives find out? What if the people that live next to us find out? What if the people we play mahjong would find out? Within the Chinese community, there's a culture of unspoken shame with being a dreamer and an undocumented immigrant, and therefore it's something that we keep very close to our hearts. And don't share with anyone unless it's really necessary. Um, you guys are all very important tonight. <laughs> um, this in turn results in a culture within the community where Resources are not shared and used where knowledge is not passed along and just where mutual support doesn't really exist the way that it does in other places. A great example of that is, despite being very open about my story and my status, the past 10 years I've met maybe five Asian American dreamers, maybe six, I met some, someone new tonight, all whom I met over the past eight months. DACA has given me and many others the ability to do a lot of things and live a much more regular life but I still have to plan my future in spans of two years, which is how long each DACA renewal is. I still can't travel abroad for work, school, or vacation. I still get nervous every time I drive and think about getting reactive. The officer asks me what the temporary visitor stamp on my license means. There are 2.8 million other young people who have these fears and even more because they do not have DACA. There are 2.8 million other young people who don't have the privilege of missing, dismissing my mother's repetitive warnings. And that's why we have a lot of work to do, and that's one of the reasons why I share my story. Thank you very much for your time, for listening. I appreciate it. My name is Xiaodan. Eleven years ago, eleven years ago, I came to United States from China. Uh, my story in growing up, living in U.S., it's a story of searching for a sense of belonging, and also reflects a global migration that in mid eight uh, nineties, uh, at height of migration from my province Fujian. I was six years old. My family was in a, a serious financial situation when my parents have to borrow a private loan. Things went all wrong and my dad had to leave China to come to US to rebuild the life. In one of these afternoon, my mom brought me to my relative's house in a different city. Uh, in a conversation without knowing, she left without a goodbye, and that lasted for two years. Uh, 13 years from there, we spent, we met for a few times. I would always miss, be missing her. Um, 
and I turn it out to become a Klaus clown, always need attention. Uh, I remember one of these times when I saw my mom around my age of 10. She was, at the time, could not afford even just normal logistics, but she brought me this 18 yuan pies. It's an expensive snack, and I felt really guilty of eating it. Meanwhile, my cousin I live with, he eats fast and eats a lot. They are a little, it falls on the ground too, and I was very, I, I, I felt sadness and pain because, because my mom had to give me everything she could, and I worried if she could not take care of herself. And in my age of 19, I went back to live with my mom, and I was being told I, I was going to America. Moving to America, I, this, kind, this sense of searching for belonging extended into my work as a delivery worker. Uh, in the first year working as a delivery worker, it wasn't so obvious because I, I served uh, Mexican families and supermarket workers, but uh, two years ago, my another deliver worker work job was in Manhattan. Uh, it was qu uh, quite an alienating work environment. Encountered many instances of uh, prejudice and uh, alienating treatment from front desk and even my clients, as well as my as well as my employers, delivering ice creams in a blizzard weather when receiving no tips and being slammed off the door in front of you, or when incident happened on the road, the, te the drivers will tell you, I okay, once I said okay, he gave me a high, high five and left, or all sorts of mockeries by clients or front desk who were having a bad day because we were the one, they do not have to see off any in the, uh, again, and uh, we were, we were, and we were invisible workers. Um, my experiences growing up and working in New York City as a bike delivery workers, it's with uh, connected threats of a search of sense of belonging, and it has been my weakness. But however, over time, it had becoming a different kind of strength to make me more observant and sympathetic of others, to be always be able to observe. And also, my bike delivery work had led me to have opportunity to be working with Dolly, a research group on biking communities for immigrant workers. Uh, I even got my first job with uh, transportation alternatives through uh, this kind of experience. That is my story. Thank you. So my name, do I remove this? Hi, so my name is Stephanie G. One Park, um, and I'm currently a DACA recipient. Um, I'm undocumented, and I am a community organizer at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, I'm also a co-founder of the Asian American Dreamers Collective, and uh, the vice chair of the board of directors at United We Dream, which is the largest um, undocumented youth-led network in the country. Um, and today I'm up here to share my story with you guys. Um, just a little correction, I actually came to this country when I was five years old, not as a teenager, um, but the bio was correct. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I came here in 1998, a month away from my sixth birthday. Um, my father, from South Korea, uh, my father had already come a couple of months before, um, and I came with my mother and my younger brother, who was two years old. Um, I also have an older sister, and she came to this country separately four months after us. Um, and so we entered on a tourist visa, which gives you 90 days, sometimes a little bit more, um, to stay in this country um, and to be able to adjust your status in that time frame if you're choosing to stay lawfully. Um, so with my uh, family, we were supposed to get religious visas through a Korean church. 
um, which is kind of a common way for some folks in the Korean community. And um, that felt, and all of this I learned only in the last year, um, because as Antonio and others have expressed, like the sense of shame and secrecy that's in some Asian cultures, or especially in my families. Um, so we were supposed to get a religious visa, and that was supposed to be through a family member who had invested in this Korean church. Um, and the pastor was supposed to acknowledge, um, authorize this, and but because of an internal church fight between this family member and the pastor about who should have control over the church, um, in a kind of, I considered a very Korean manner, my parents were just told like, oh, we've never heard of this religious visa from this family member who we were supposed to do it through. Um, and so that's how we became undocumented in 1999. Um, and I always knew, because I have memories from Korea, that I wasn't a citizen of the United States. I didn't have a passport, um, didn't know that I was undocumented, didn't know. I knew that I didn't have this thing called a green card because I've never seen it like rummaging my parents' like closets. Um, and so the way that I found out was, um, for me, I think a very unique and privileged path compared to other undocumented folks that I've met. Um, starting in the sixth grade, I went to the Horace Mann School, which is a private school up in Riverdale. Um, and out of the, my three siblings, I was the only one who attended this school. Um, and so for some background information, the school is like $40,000 a year to attend. It's not a boarding school. Um, my parents, my mother continues to work at a nail salon, and my father continues to work at uh, dry cleaners, um, and that's been since we've moved here. Um, and so I attended the school for seven years and until graduating in high school. And in middle school, the schools are all connected. So everyone knew about this big Bahamas trip to the Bahamas. It's a week-long trip. And so I remember in middle school, like internally worrying, like, will I be able to go there? Because I know that I'm not a US citizen. I know that I don't have a passport. Um, so I asked my mom, like, would I be able to go on this trip to the Bahamas? Um, and that's how I learned that I wasn't um, able to travel outside the country. And, but again, it came in pieces because my parents never fully shared with us um, our situation. Um, so fast forward a couple of years when I'm applying for summer programs um, to, it was a summer program at Harvard and I was going through the application online and it asks if you're a citizen or if you're a US permanent resident. Um, so I knew I wasn't a citizen. I assumed that I was a US permanent resident just from how the word is stated. I've permanently resided in the US. Um, <laughs> but I could not refresh the page because it was asking for like a nine digit social security number, um, which I did not have. And so that's how I found out that I was also not a permanent resident. Um, and then I guess the, when I finally realized my status, um, as being totally undocumented is when I had a meeting with my college advisor at Horace Mann. Um, and I remember when I tried to explain to my situation, I was like, I don't have a social security number. We don't have green cards. Um, and that's how I could explain it to him. And that's when he was just like, and he had tears in his eyes and he was just like, oh my goodness. I think I called myself illegal because at that point I did not even know of the word undocumented. So I was like, I'm illegal. And he was like, oh wow, you are undocumented. Um, and his response was more like he needed Kleenexes. I'm pretty good at like <laughs> stifling my emotions, I think, as a Korean or as an immigrant. Um, but uh, <laughs> he was in tears and he was like, oh my goodness, what, like, how could this be? Um, like you dress, I mean, yeah, because I think another, an, another added aspect was that I was also hiding my class as a working class, um, as a daughter of working class parents. And all my friends were, you know, comes from millionaire and billionaire families. So for his response, it's like, what, your English is perfect. You dress like them. How could you be undocumented? Um, and that's really just been my experience a lot of the time since um, having come out as being undocumented and having that being the response and understanding how, what an insane privilege that is, where it's not like already assuming me to be a criminal because of the color of my skin um, and assuming like, wow, you, you should not be in this situation. I don't know about the other people, but it should not be you in this situation. Um, and so from there, uh, I was applying to colleges at a time before DACA was uh, announced. So in 2011, I graduated high school and for applying to colleges, I was also not a straight A student. So we had to find like, schools that had kind of heard of undocumented students and would will be willing to accept them and give them scholarships, though financial aid is not available. Um, thankfully, I was able to go to the Macaulay Honors College, which is here in New York, and I went at Hunter College where I was able to get free tuition, free dorms, and a free laptop. Um, 
And there is where I really, I studied English history and media studies, but it was really through the lens of black Americans and other oppressed peoples in this country. Um, and there I learned um, a quote that I'll share with you guys by a poet named Denise Froman, where she says, your wound is probably not your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. Um, so from there is where I, a lot of my, yeah, my thesis on like black studies, um, but realizing I'm, I'm not a black person, um, I will never uh, understand that experience, but what I do know and have experienced is being an undocumented Asian person. Um, and so that's from there I became, a, after graduation, an uh, Immigrant Justice Corps Fellow at the Min Kwan Center, which is the organization that actually um, did my DACA applications back in 2013. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be a legal service provider there. Um, where I filed over 300 DACA applications. Um, but from there, it was also being a legal service provider. It wasn't enough. People, I could tell, like, the clients that were coming in, it was they did not want to be in the space. And I remember it as well. It's traumatic to be in the space where you're reminded that you're undocumented every two years. Um, so being a legal service provider, the one thing that I realized really did empower my clients and community members is saying, like, I have DACA as well. Um, and a lot of their jaws would drop because they wouldn't even see that as like an opportunity of being documented, but being able to understand and practice the law. Um, and so from there, that's where I realized that we just need uh, what, in my belief, the Asian undocumented community needs right now is um, we have the legal services. We could always use more of it, um, but real education and organizing capacity. Um, and I think oftentimes, I, need, I think part of the reason why events like this exist is to highlight that immigration, undocumented immigration, is not just a Latinx issue, um, and it's an issue that affects Asians as well. And I get asked all the time, like, why are people so silent about it? Why don't people come out? Um, and part of it, I think, is just a matter of time. Um, and another part of it, I think, is to also realize that being loud isn't the only way to show your power. Um, there are other ways to do that as well. Um, so thank you for listening to my story. Everyone, um, let me see if I can adjust this. Um, my name is Teresa Lee. Uh, when I was seven years old, my dad called my brothers and me into the family living room for a very important meeting. He said, I have a very serious secret to tell you kids. You can't tell anyone outside the family about this. We are undocumented. We don't have this paper that uh, says we're allowed to live here. There's this thing called a green card and a citizenship, and we have neither. We're supposed to go to Brazil, where I was born, or South Korea, where my parents were born. It's complicated. We could even be separated if anyone found out about our status. That's why we cannot tell anyone the kind of fear um, that you grow up with when you're an undocumented child is all pervasive. I've shared many stories with my fellow undocumented friends of the recurring nightmares we grew up experiencing with uh, 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 paramilitary style police raids, with, uh, your family members taken away or worse. And with this fear comes a deep sense of isolation. Like most undocumented kids, I also grew up extremely poor. For years, our family lived in a basement in Chicago with no furniture or beds. We slept on hammocks because the basement floated every time it rained. There was no hot water or heat, and some days we would go without food. It was around that time that I started playing the piano at my dad's church. My dad was a pastor who was never quite able to grow his congregation enough to um, uh, be eligible for a religious workers visa, but he did have uh, a wealthy parishioner who, when she found out how we were living, bought us uh, thousands of dollars uh, of worth of uh, new furniture, including a piano for me. And I fell in love with the piano. It gave me joy and a sense of purpose. 
uh, as well as uh, respite from harsher real realities of life. I became the church's full-time pianist by the age of nine, uh, the accompanist for my school choir, and I started winning some local piano competitions. And when I was in high school, I got a full scholarship to the Mayor School of Music, and within a year, uh, I won a bigger competition, which meant I got to perform the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And I was the first inner city kid in Chicago's history to do so. <clears throat> It was around this time that uh, the artistic director of the music school where I was attending, Anne Monaco, she called me into her office to ask what colleges I would be applying to. Now, I had always assumed that going to college would be an impossibility for me, especially at that time. Even if I could get a scholarship, there were no dream teams on campuses back then, no undocumented activists, no support groups. There was no public sympathy. There was just me, a frightened 17-year-old girl, and her confused teacher, because I sheepishly told her that I wasn't going to college. Anne Monaco, she maintained her composure and simply handed me 10 college application forms and handed them to me and told me to uh, fill them out and return them back to her. And I did what, uh, what she said. And she immediately noticed the missing social security number. I burst into tears. I confessed to her that I was undocumented and asked her to please not report me to the police because I could not be responsible for separating my family. What she did instead was to begin looking ways to help me that led us to Senator Dick Durbin's office. And Senator Dick Durbin looked into my case and he saw uh, an outdated, unjust system. And he said I would have to be deported back to my birthplace, which was Brazil. And so what we did next was we st started gathering letters of support from every source I knew uh, including my mentors, my teachers, the board of directors of the music school, the donors of the music school, who happened to know Senator Durbin directly. And so Senator Durbin decided to write a personal bill on behalf of me, and that became known as the DREAM Act. By 2001, I had made it to the Manhattan School of Music in New York City, up, uptown, uh, on a full scholarship. And on September 11th of that year, I was on my way to the airport to fly to Washington, D.C. for a hearing on the DREAM Act. We had 62 votes lined up. It was ready to pass. We may have had 67, which would have ridden a president's veto. And President Bush was ready to sign it into law. When all flights were canceled due to the terrorist attacks, in addition to the horror that we all felt that day, what it meant for the DREAM Act was that a bill that was going to be easily and uncontroversially passed would stall for over 18 years. The mood of the country changed that day. The American public became more fearful, particularly of the, uh, the perceived outsiders, and any immigrant-friendly legislation was out of the question. Over the next few years, though, the dreamers began bravely coming out of the shadows to tell their stories, to share the stories, leading a national movement to demonstrate, to organize, to march, to support one another, even change the narrative of, the, uh, of immigration. And most importantly, the dreamers won public support because we're starting to understand what it's going to take for our undocumented mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, our neighbors, to finally see some justice and to be treated with some respect. And that means, for on our part, that we have to combat this fear that came out of 9-11, that was exploited exponentially to justify a war on terror the fear exploited to creating the very DHS, a direct response of 9-11 under Bush, that funds our very politicians that's supposed to protect us, 
that controls the detention centers that uh, unless they meet a quota of 34,000 beds a night, they will lose their funding from the government. The fear that was exploited to justify mass deportation and separation of millions of our family members, the fear that is being exploited right now under Trump, Trump's expansion of that very system was set in place before him to fight this war on terror. To see real justice for me, for our people, means combating the fear by saying, no more war, no more hate, no more racism, no more criminalizing people of color, no more exploiting human rights for war, for money, for political success. To see real justice means combating this fear with love, with empathy and care for our neighbors, for example, making sure that there's a safe sanctuary space in, our, in your own neighborhoods. And I believe that this is the first step to a broader, sane, comprehensive immigration reform. Thank you. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a panelist, these two panelists here, and I'm going to introduce them shortly. And we're going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to have the uh, storytellers come back on stage, join us, and then we'll have a discussion with everyone on stage together. And uh, to my left is Rose Quizan Villazor. She is a professor of law right now at UC Davis Law School. But come July, she'll be at Rutgers Law School in Newark, and she's a professor specializing in immigration and Asian Americans. So thank you for coming. Thank you. And to my right is Steve Choi. He's a community advocate, and he's the head of the New York Immigration Coalition. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Chris. The Asian American Bar and Asian Society saw that Asian Americans were not part of the political discourse about immigration in a way that we thought Asian, Asian Americans should be. And this is one of the impetuses for the program that we did today. So I'm just going to let our experts just sort of react to what we heard and to place them within the context of their expertise. So either of you I want to start? Any, anybody? Give us your reactions. Place them within the context of the important work that you do. Rose? Sir, I'll start. Oh, okay. um, I'm still processing the stories that we heard. Um, you're, you're all so brave, and I'm inspired by the work that you've done. And to, there are certain themes that I heard from the stories tonight. Um, one is a sense of shame and secrecy within the Asian American community. Um, the fear of being removed from the home, uh, from the country that they call their home, and their neighborhoods and their communities, and separation from their families. And also the desire to create change, right? That there, there is this ongoing understanding of immigration law as broken. And the stories to me highlight just how broken the immigration law system is, that we need comprehensive immigration reform. We don't have enough paths to immigrate to the United States. We don't have enough methods of allowing people to adjust their status so then they can become full members of the American political family. Um, and there's not enough political will sometimes within the Asian American community. And that's something that absolutely has to change. Steve? Well, first, I just want to recognize and um, really honor the folks who came forward today and spoke so eloquently and passionately. You know, it was really moving. I, I, can we give them all another round of applause? I mean, that was amazing. <laughs> um, I, and I, I think that's one thing that I've really been struck by um, in working on immigration for the past 15 years um, has been that it really has been the leadership of young undocumented immigrants and in our community, Asian American um, young undocumented immigrants who have actually changed the narrative. It's, it's really amazing. Um, I remember during my time when I used to be the executive director of the Min Kwan Center for Community Action, um, for so long we just took it for granted that um, Folks, would not, folks who were undocumented would not come out about their status. And it was this source of shame. And it kind of was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I remember right maybe five, six years ago, 
um, there was a crew of these young Korean American undocumented immigrants who didn't accept that. You know, folks like Tony Choi and Emily Park and um, David Chung, who all of a sudden said, you know what, I'm undocumented, but I'm unafraid. And I just remember the reaction of the people, the Korean media was like, what, how can you be saying that? And they were like, I'm undocumented, I'm unafraid. And it just blew people's minds. But it, it helped to really normalize the fact that there are undocumented folks. Think about 15% of all APIs, of all Asian Americans, are actually undocumented immigrants. And so it helped to normalize that. And people started to realize, like, hey, the sky doesn't fall. You know, folks are undocumented. They're coming out, and they're not afraid. And it really helped to change the dynamic, particularly with the Korean community. So I, I think that's important to understand when we look at our community and how we deal with immigration and how we deal with, sheer, uh, with shame and fear, that it really is, is uh, the work of some amazing activists who have come out and actually talked about that and really changed the course of the narrative there. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, uh, you know, especially in this day and age where we face a president who is, uh, what's, what's the right words I can use? Uh, ah. I'm not going to suggest one. <laughs> I think Asian Americans find them, uh, find ourselves in a very interesting place right now. Um, because I do think that we are in a situation where actually the top two sending countries right now of immigrants to the United States, it's not Mexico, it's not the Dominican Republic, it's India and China. So when we are talking about immigration, we are really talking about, in many ways, what is an API issue? What is an Asian American issue? But I think it has been a struggle for so long to have Asian American communities have their interests represented and to really sort of stand up as well. Um, the last time we were actually talking about immigration reform was in 2013. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time, um, you know, Senator Schumer was leading this big bill and they were trying to get 70 co-sponsors onto this bill that eventually got 69 co-sponsors in the Senate and passed the Senate. And this was a bill that was terrible for Asian Americans. And, you know, it really would have cut down on the ways that folks, that Asian American communities rely on to bring their family members over. Um, and it really would have had these terrible negative consequences. And I remember we were talking with Representative um, Grace Meck at the time. We said, this is a bad bill. You should come out publicly against Senator Schumer and say that. And to our great surprise, she said yes. Um, and so she came out publicly. And, and what I remember was a couple days later, I got a call from Senator Schumer's office. And they said, we're going to get on a call. And we're going to talk about how this bill is good for Asian American community members. And we're going to have a very special guest, Grace Meng. I said, oh my god, what kind of pressure did you put on Grace to be able to, to do that? Um, but that's something that was really striking to me, is that we were having a conversation about immigration, and Asian American communities were not at the table. Um, and, and, then, and then once, then one in one direction, political pressure just pushed in another. So how do we get those communities out of the dark, into the light, to tell that story and to be part of that political process? So I think it is changing, but I do think that there needs to be a reckoning within the Asian American community because a lot of times right now, the loudest voices that you hear are conservative um, Asian Americans talking about um, why they actually are not in favor of immigrant rights. And there's been, uh, and they get a lot of media attention. Um, but I think it's absolutely critical that we do that. And I think the issue with our communities under the Trump administration is there's a little bit of sense like that doesn't affect us. Right? Right. There, he's actually talking about the brown people or the black people, and that's not us. And I think it's a fundamental misreading of Asian Americans in this country's history. The very first anti-immigrant laws ever passed in, this, in the United States were the anti -China, it was the Chinese Exclusion Act. The federal law began to exclude people because of Chinese laborers. Absolutely. And before that, there was no real bureaucracy to exclude people. It was basically open borders, right? And well, actually, yeah. so it's not just, it's not against the laborers. The very first um, Chinese exclusion was against Chinese women, prostitutes, in 1875, which predated the Chinese Exclusion Act. So we need to remember the intersectionality of race and gender that operates within our immigration law framework. 
Um, but yes, there were bars to immigrating to the United States based on race. That started with the Chinese, and then it moved on to all Asian American groups, or Asian groups, except for Filipinos, because mm -hmm. Filipinos, the Philippines was a U.S. territory for about 50 years. So the Exclusion Act did not apply to them. They were not aliens because they were subjects. And so they were able to immigrate to the United States, but they were not eligible for citizenship, just like all other Asian, Asian immigrants who came here because they were not white, nor were they people of African descent. And that exclusion from citizenship then led to ongoing marginalization and subordination of Chinese and Japanese and many other Asian groups. The alien land laws were passed in the, um, in the 1900s. Um, there were bars to getting jobs, to uh, working as a lawyer, to working in restaurants. There were limitations on the kinds of restaurants that Asian immigrants could open up. There was a whole comprehensive desire by federal and state and local governments to exclude Asians, uh, Asian Americans. And immigration law was at the root of that. So if contemporary Asian Americans are not aware of that history, they should be. That's number one, they mm -hmm. should take your class. And then number two, <laughs> to Steve's point, it is not someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. It's our problem. It was there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. it, it, it began for Asians in America. So we have a special, unique duty in this fight yes. to know our history, fight for justice, be a part of that coalition, and tell that story. Because I think when I hear that story and you come out of the shadows and you're in the light, you tell that story, Teresa, that story begins the political dynamic that others pick. It gets rerouted by 9-11, but then it ha finds new life later on with allies, right? And so political change, we often think, how do I change that? I can't, so I won't. But it starts with one story, one person being brave, setting something in motion, talking to a local senator, congresswoman, congressman, and that's how it begins. Yeah. Right? And, and I actually don't think we need to go back to the 19th century <laughs> to talk about how, you know, the, really the situations that Asian American communities face. There always is this distrust of the outsider. We can look at the 21st century, mm -hmm. right? The uh, folks can remember the controversy around Wen Ho Lee and, and the, the, the accusations made against then. But even special registration, you know, in the wake of 9 11, the Bush administration launched this program, special registration, requiring every single male from all these different countries, including Asian countries, African countries, that resulted in tens of thousands of people being deported and not a single terrorism conviction. So, you know, we don't have to look that far back in history. We can look back 10 or 15 years and we see an example of how Asian Americans, with one click of the racial targeting wheel, we were the ones who were really being targeted. And I think it's important to remember that. That's right. I mean, I think that historically we should never think, oh, you know, things are always getting better. That was so long ago and that was the past, right? And that was when we were much more racist and we're good now. But I think that, you know, I, I, I think it, if you have that, people sort of have that general sense of progress. But I think that, you know, our society and what's happening is much more cyclical mm -hmm. and it's much more sort of a back and forth. And we're really in a conservative era mm -hmm. in America and also the world, mm -hmm. you know, f as it relates to these issues that we should care about. Can I just address the narrative uh, discussion here? Um, it's, um, as, as we move forward and engage in a coordinated um, strategy with other immigrant groups, um, there's, the, there's the issue of narrative. What should the narrative, what should it be? We, have, we heard the dreamer stories and, and it's a very, their stories are compelling and, um, and important to highlight. But at the same time, um, it creates a wedge between parents and of the undocumented parents and dreamers. And so what I'm seeing more now um, with the advocacy for DACA recipients and the dreamers is a much more a broader call for change that would be inclusive of all people, um, of immigrants, uh, immigrant parents, those who don't have any children, but because they've been here, they belong here. And that's the theme also that we heard tonight. Because of that, sense of belonging, that this is their home, then we must change immigration law. So, of course, DACA was not 
uh, temp it, it was temporary. It did not provide any kind of permanent relief. So already there, that was that uh, we needed to move forward beyond what President Obama did. But as we continue to collaborate with other groups, it's important to think about what, who the law should cover. Yeah, and I think I've heard that before. It is not the end all be all. DACA mm -hmm. is not an end all be all. It is just one in a series of improvements that a coalition looking at this uh, issue, working together, can work together to create a more cohesive or comprehensive solution. But within our political um, reality today, that's going to be very difficult. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, can I have the storytellers come up on stage and join us? They're going to put them around. Us. Welcome. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, do you have questions for each other, or is there any sort of reaction to the discussion we've had that you would, you want to sort of share with us? So, floor is open. Um, yeah, I can uh, just um, regarding Teresa. This is it on? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Uh, the story that Teresa shared. Um, I found that historical. Bit, uh, very important. I didn't under I didn't realize the whole that the bill was supposed to be discussed on September 11th, 2001. Um, so I think that is fascinating. But also on top of that, um, beyond 9/11, um, having a black president, I think, also um, made it so that any type of immigration reform or anything that he's proposed would have been just automatically shut down. Um, but yeah, I found that part of the story yeah, fascinating and that you were part of that history that will definitely be in history books. Thank you. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is awesome. No, no, thank I, you. I think something really interesting is, um, maybe some of you guys agree tonight, is uh, as I attend more of these events and meet more dreamers and meet more individuals who are involved in this, act, this group of activism, there's a lot of things that I'm learning way more of, and I think the historical aspect of it is really it, interesting and it's eye-opening in that aspect, um, while at the same time, um, it gets me to understand that I feel like a lot of my friends didn't really understand what DACA was. They didn't really understand what being undocumented meant, other than the fact that I didn't have a passport, which I do, uh, a Venezuelan passport um, or a green card. Um, and I think that, kind of got, you know, gets me thinking of, I think one big issue of it is the lack of education in, you know, in our communities, but also just in the U.S. in general that can keep, like, I feel like keep immigration reform from happening. Um, one, one, thought, uh, one thought I had was that the level one attack did not only delay the dream act. It's on, it's on. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the visa my, my father applied for me was also delayed, along with other many thousands of other immigrants. Um, so that was the effect on myself. Um, I have to say something. Oh, you don't. You don't. Um, I, I just, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, one thing also that I feel like we didn't touch on is, um, well, kind of did with the sense of belonging, uh, but the opposite of that is isolation. Um, isolation leading to depression. And there's a huge, um, the undocumented community, there's a lot of depression. Uh, every day people wake up and not know uh, whether their families are gonna be separated or whether um, they're gonna be able to um, go to work or things like that. And so depression is um, an everyday um, issue for the undocumented community. So, I mean, and I think that that's one of the things I learned by, by talking to you all is the enormous social pressure of being undocumented and the things that it leads to, the shame, the fear, the depression. And as a lawyer, you know, we understand, oh, this is the effect of the law. This is when you put people outside the law and the immigrant essentially outside the law, uh, you know, and, and how powerful that can be, what, what kind of um, effect that has on people. I mean, what, 
what can the community do besides understanding that? Understanding that is the first thing. Previous to that, we didn't ever think about driving the target without a license and having that be an issue, you know, about the depression sort of be debilitating and isolation. I mean, what, what do you think the Asian American community can do, you know, besides hearing that story and recognizing it? I think that um, this uh, panel, this setting tonight, storytelling is extremely important. And uh, for, uh, in my mom's case, for example, she reads Korean media news sources. And uh, incredibly, <clears throat> she uh, has uh, a right-wing conservative viewpoint of the world. <laughs> and uh, even though she herself is undocumented, <laughs> she herself believes that um, you know, uh, we uh, don't deserve rights as human beings to be here because we are here and legally. And so this is a, a, such a misconception of what, um, who we are as human beings, as uh, what, we, what we deserve as human beings, and um, the kind of uh, stories we tell is extremely important. The way we tell the stories, um, for example, not illegal, but undocumented. So a human being is illegal, and that uh, has been a campaign that's been going on for years and years. Um, and so the uh, news media sources, I think, is extremely important um, uh, impact that needs to be, um, I don't know, ta tackled or Thank you. discussed. I, th I think one thing that I would say is that uh, I'm really struck sort of working with all these different legal service providers. I used to be at Minquan when, when DACA came down. We, we processed a lot of these DACA applications. There's a huge need in the Asian American community around immigration legal services. A huge need. And yet, for whatever reason, we don't seem to think of this as a need that needs to be addressed. There are 70,000 undocumented Chinese immigrants in New York State. And yet, when we think about undocumented immigrants in New York State, we don't think of the Chinese community. Um, there is not a single Chinese community-based legal services provider um, that provides immigration legal services. And you see the effects of that. I mean, it's something that, that we see. And what happens is, for the Chinese community, all those, those 70,000 undocumented um, immigrants who are, who are from the Chinese, uh, with Chinese background, what they do is they actually, there's a cottage industry down in Chinatown that basically says, here's what you do if you're undocumented. You can apply for asylum, and you can claim that you're a Falun Gong member, or you can claim that you wanted to have two children in violation of the one-child policy. And I'm going to tell you exactly what to say to the immigration judge. And you know what happens? It, the, the number of Chinese asylum applications in New York is something like the next, is equal to the number of the next 15 countries combined. And so what happens? The, the immigration judges and the examiners at a certain point get really jaded, and they say, I don't believe you anymore. I've heard the same story so many different times. And so the rejection rate of Chinese uh, folks applying for asylum is something like 70%. It's ridiculously high. And so at that point, if you've gone through the system, you've gone to the shady legal service, this, this shady you know, immigration lawyer down in Chinatown, and you, know, you paid money, and you've gotten your asylum claim rejected. And the options at that point are not that great. So, I, and I bring this up because the Chinese immigrant community is right now, as of 2018, probably the single largest immigrant community in New York City. And yet, it is inexcusable to me that we do not have a Chinese community-based legal services provider. So I think we've got to shine the spotlight on that. We need to think about what we can do as lawyers, as advocates, as activists, as whatever we are, we need to say this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Are you on that, Chris? I, 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 I just, it, just, it just got on my list. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it's funny. You know, I, I was thinking as you were saying that in my church, uh, someone asked me once to come and vouch for them. Uh, and he had been coming to church for the previous two years and came in late and left early. And I was like, oh, I think I know what this is about. You know? But you always want to be open. You don't want to be close to it. You know, you give people the benefit of the doubt. And... Um, and I went into the immigration hearing, 
And I guess I'm a Chinese person, so everyone treated me really poorly. And I was thinking, oh, this is interesting. This is how they get treated. You know, I, at that time, I worked for a federal agency, and I knew how people treated me when, I, when they came into my office. And I was still me, but I was a Chinese person in the, in the, in the court. And uh, you know, when I spoke English, they were all like, what? You know, they were very surprised. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And, um, and I told the person applying, I will tell the truth that I've seen you in church for the past two years, but I will not say anything beyond that. You know, and then right before we walked, we walked in, he's like, 2015, can you go back to then? I was like, no. <laughs> you know, so we went in, and I sort of did my thing, and he was granted right there. But I saw the docket, 90% Chinese names, right? And then he pressed a red envelope into my hand. <laughs> At the end, I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I do want my job. <laughs> but seriously, I didn't know that, and um, I know how much these guys cost when they go to these small time lawyers in and around Chinatown and City Hall. And I don't know how good of a legal services they're getting. So. All right, are there any questions that you have for each other? Or maybe it's a time for audience questions, if there are any. It's in the back. Yep. For the last 57 years, I've been teaching in American universities, also in China, Russia, UK, and elsewhere, and organized conferences in China, published with Chinese universities, and, and et cetera. And I have a company that does that. I'm very surprised of two aspects of this discussion. The first aspect is Chinese person should remember that they have the heritage of the best civilization in the entire globe. There's no civilization that has contributed so much from Xi'an in terms of sciences, in terms of art, in terms of technology, in terms of philosophy. So your first task is that the American, excuse the language, should kiss your behind and ask you to help them that's nice. Sign for you, Why don't we get to the question? <laughs> <laughs> There's so much in Chinese culture that you should be proud of making American Chinese rather than they think that there's something American that you have to Americanize yourself. That's the first point. The second point is the Rudolph the Red Nose uh, story. In the future, near future, because Americans' productivity has is now is mostly in making weapons of mass destruction, while PRC under Xi has infrastructure and expanding. So the future of the world depends on Sino, Sino connection. So as America becomes more and more, become weaker in economics and China rises, the Chinese Americans in America are the one who would save America. Is there a question at the end? They're the most important one. Okay. So <laughs> my question is, how come, how come you do not realize or emphasize the proud heritage that you have, and how come you do not see that you will be the most important force in America? Thank you. Anybody want to take that, or maybe we can save that for the after party. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you've got a question, ask it, ask it quick, and then we'll save the statements and discussion for, for afterwards where we'll be on the first floor. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, it was very special to hear. I have a small Chinese and English translation company that I started three years ago, and um, as of a year ago, I started serving the Legal Aid Society for some pro bono legal translations for the Chinese community. My question is, we've translated some Know Your Rights fact sheets for DACA and um, some cases as well. Does the Dreamer community, um, the Chinese speaking community, know that there is such resources at the Legal Aid Society? If not, how can we help to 
sort of spread the word that they can get help for free, legal help, at, uh, with top lawyers. Thank you very much. I think for myself, I mean, for example, when I first applied for DACA through the Minquan Center, um, the way that my mom found out about it was through a little clipping in like the ethnic Korean newspaper that Minquan had put out there. Um, so I would say your best bet would be through um, reaching out to ethnic media, um, but then also when you do that, you also keep in mind um, to do education trainings for those reporters as well so that they're not misquoting you or misrepresenting any type of information. Um, but yeah, I mean, from my own personal experience, it's been through ethnic media. It's not, yeah, my parents as immigrants, sometimes through churches, but for those who don't belong to those types of community groups either, the one thing that they will do is read their country's newspapers or yeah. radio stations. And, and I think to Steve's point, just, just to, as a quick answer, is that Chinese immigrants really pass on information to one another. You know, so they're like, asylum is the path. Asylum is the that's path. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is how you do it. You know, so DACA is like, oh, I don't know. That's kind of indeterminate. Who knows? But we know the asylum path. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, to uh, can follow up this question, I believe legal society provides very limited service to adults. Uh, DACA, uh, we, we spoke that there are very few uh, facilities for legal service in Chinese community, but this is not the case for uh, under, for DACA cases. There's the question. Question over there? I just wanted to oh, comment, yes, sorry. sorry. Um, and then question. Yes, yeah, I wanted to comment that I've never heard about that. Um, mm. And I don't think my mom has either. I don't think anyone in my family has heard about really free legal services until like me interacting with this group of people. Right. Um, interacting at events like this. So I, um, you know, coming here when we apply for asylum, we got a private lawyer who charged a lot of money um, and would kind of, you know, make the decision between eating, eating a fuller meal versus paying whatever fee they were charging us. So I think it's de there's definitely a need for it. Um, and I think some, these might be some good solutions. Yeah, so we asked the Chinese, Chinese language media in New York that's been here to you know, print that in the newspaper um, you know, make that report. Maybe that's the beginning for that particular issue. Uh, you know, Chinese language, because language is an issue. Uh, you know, people in Flushing or in Brooklyn who are Chinese immigrants, coming to Manhattan's a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing legal services is a big deal. Like, it's hard for us to imagine, but it's a big deal for them to, to come out of there. You know, I was coming home from Flushing to to, to Manhattan once, and I took a Chinese car service, and the guy was like, oh, I haven't been to Manhattan in months. You know? And I was like, wow, you never leave Flushing. You know? <laughs> it's our cocoon, you know? It's, these, are, these are worlds that we have to know, have a fluency in, both in language and culture, and sensitivity to know what is needed. And you know, for them, maybe DACA is not the answer. You know, they're like, I don't know, it's not good for me. I want asylum, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, just really quickly, there, there, I remember when DACA happened in 2012, and there's a significant difference in the level of sophistication and understanding with just the ethnic media. The Korean press knew about it, partly because you had groups like the Minquan Center and other groups like that talking about DACA a lot, right? Having folks who are undocumented and unafraid forcing the issue, talking about that. Um, and I think partly because, to be frank, looking at the landscape of Chinese organizations. There are some good organizations, but you know, there's just not been the kind of support for these organizations to get into that immigration space and to help change the conversation in the media and in the community. You know, I had folks say, saying like, you know, uh, hey, why should I apply? Exactly, why should I apply for DACA if I can get asylum? And I remember as a lawyer thinking, that is a ridiculous question. Like, you should. That, that's not even. That should not even be considered. Like, you have to. You, like going for DACA is something at that time which was considered something really valuable. You should apply for that. And so I remember being shocked that that question was even being answered. But it spoke volumes as to the fact that I think with the Chinese community, there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done. There's a question over there. Uh, hi. Uh, so my name, is, my name is May, and I am um, with the Chinese Progressive Association. 
which is a community group in Chinatown. Um, and I, I know right now we're fighting all kinds of things and you know, we're, uh, a lot of things are under attack. Um, and um, some, you know, I guess the four of you are DACA recipients, but we know that DACA is, well, the four students, right? Well, it doesn't matter. Three? Okay, three yeah. or four, okay. Um, uh, so, but we know there are other things besides DACA, because DACA is just the program that draws a group, a limit, a group around, draws a line around a group of people, so, and it helps them to, you know, get certain benefits. So, what else would you like to see uh, in terms of immigration reform in the future, besides more DACA? Well, I'll tell you what I don't want to see. Um, maybe that would be a starting point. There's a bill right now in Congress, it's called the RAISE Act, that is trying to limit the number of, of family-based immigrants who can come here. That's the family-based immigration law is family-based visas. Um, composed of the majority of immigrant visas to the United States, and then followed by employment, and then diversity. And all of them are under, both family and diversity are under attack. And so that would have a significant impact on the Asian American community. Um, what does the Race Act try to do? It prohibits children from petitioning their parents, um, from petitioning their older children um, over 21 years old, so that's the one that is currently in Congress. Thankfully, hasn't gone far. But that's the bill that President Trump is backing. And so I would like to talk about what I want out of what comprehensive immigration reform would look like. No wall, no detention bed uh, requirements, um, no racial profiling of Latinos and other immigrants of color. But I also want to make sure that we stop these proposals that are seeking to, uh, to diminish the ability of families to be together in the United States. So, and I would just say briefly, I think, you know, Teresa touched on this, um, Stephanie touched on this, I think there's a lot of language coming out of the Trump administration. Like, we're just focusing on the criminals or the bad guys or the bad hombres. That's complete. What's the word I'm looking for? Chris? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a crew of xenophobic, I think racist, bigoted people within the administration, people like Stephen Miller, and their goal is to complete, like, limit the number of people of color coming into this country, period. And trying to make it hard for immigrants, whether you're coming from Latin America, whether you're coming from Africa or the asshole countries, or or whether you're coming from Asia as well. I think there is a sustained assault against immigrants. And it comes from things like you know, preventing the spouses of H-1B holders to work. So it's, it's pointless and it's petty, but this is the way that the Stephen Millers of the world think. Or whether we're talking about the RAISE Act, or whether we're talking about DACA, people talking about you know, through both sides of the mouth, saying they support them. It, it is. We should be able to look past that and understand that this is not about, quote unquote, the bad guys. It is about a sustained assault against every facet of our immigration system designed to stop people of color from coming into the country. Having Here a is. family, making a living, establishing roots, raise, raising your kids. That's what it wants to prevent. It wants to prevent people who are brown, black, yellow, anything coming into this country for some and really is just throwing red meat to the folks who respond to the Stephen Millers and think that that guy's a good guy, right? And, and, and we must understand we cannot fall prey to thinking, yeah, yeah, it, it, it makes sense to focus on the criminals. It is completely wrong. I think we've got to be able to call it out for what it is. Thank you. And let's continue this conversation. We have a reception on the first floor. And I know Abney and Asia Society and all our community partners think of this as the beginning of a conversation that we want to continue. Thank you very much.